Welcome. I call the uh, meeting to order of the Board of Adjustment of February 7, 2019. And um, I would note uh, that the people here have either been here before or uh, one was continued from the time before, but just a little reminder to put your uh, cell phones on, on silent. And um, if you uh, have anyone here, and I don't see them here, that are not representing or the applicant, uh, we need to have you sign up uh, so you can be called to speak. There are limits and times for presentations, rebuttal, et cetera, and uh, those are all contained on your uh, agenda on the back. So shall we start with the receiving of the minutes? of January 17, 2019. Uh, motion to receive the minutes from January 17th. I'll second. We have a motion to second to receive the minutes of January 17th, 2019. Let's vote. And the minutes are received. Uh, we have any continuances? No continuances. No uh, withdrawals? OK. Um, we're down to items requiring separate vote. Item, uh, would the clerk call the items, please? We have item one, case number 14554, request for a variance to the minimum height of eight feet for a residential entryway sign and to locate on a sign on street right of way in PUD 1613 district, located at 6134 Northwest 164th Street. Now this matter was continued and you did send out additional notice, is that correct? Yes, the last meeting, uh, I had not sent out notice on the sign being on the right of way. So we re-noticed it, set it for this date. Okay, so we're here as a follow-up after the second notice has been given to cover both the variances on the uh, minimum height, eight feet, and to locate a sign on the right of way. Would you like to summarize uh, a little bit, although you did present the last time, by uh, first give your name, Certainly. address, and, uh, and then your will. presentation. I'm Jeff All, 900 Corbett Drive, Norman, Oklahoma, 73072. Here on behalf of ARIA Development to request uh, variance in, in two ways. Um, rather than build a new structure for a sign representing the name of the development at the entry, uh, there are two towers, if you will, built one on each side of the entrance. They are uh, masonry towers, and they do straddle the sidewalk. Um, so rather than building two new structures for signs, the request is to allow a height variance because these will be at roughly uh, 16 feet off the ground, and secondly, to um, to be on the right of way because what we would like to do is affix letters to the existing masonry structure stating Brookfield Estates, one on each side. So we have the exhibit that shows the... Should be. I do have uh, additional photocopies if that'll help. We had the picture of the, uh, what it was going to be placed on. Should be in there, but um, I've got I've got additional ones right here. We'll pull one off the top and one off the bottom, I think, and you'll be in good shape. Should be one picture that has no letters at the top and one picture that does have letters. Again, what are the sizes of the letters and the material? Uh, they are uh, quarter-inch flat-cut aluminum painted black, studded for blind mount into the masonry. They are uh, the letters that spell Brookfield are six inches. The letters that, that spell Estates are four inches. Okay, and so your request would be limited to the exact placement of, as you've shown in Exhibit 2, uh, and uh, uh, to the extent uh, if there are any other changes you would understand, you'd have to come back here. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, questions from board members? 
I think my only kind of thought initially when we saw this application was that to prevent any kind of gamesmanship or something, so someone might build a structure that they wouldn't need a variance and then come and get a variance for the lettering after the fact and say, well, it's already there, so why not just throw some letters on it? Sure. Um, I don't think that's happening here. Um, I, as the, I'm, I'm the sign guy. I own the sign company. Um, unfortunately, signs are typically the last thing that anybody thinks of. So the actual rendering of the development when the development was put together shows exactly what we're requesting to do. Once they get the development all up and running, they come to me and say, okay, we're ready for our sign. And I say, oh, that's great, but the sign code won't let you do that. Um, what do you mean? That's the way the architect drew it up. So um, I don't believe that they're just trying to pull a fast one here. Uh, but the, you, all, you can also see in the picture that there is somewhat limited space on either side of the entry of the development. So as to aesthetically allow the foliage that's there, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good option. Um, we can go ahead and build the structures on either side, but it uh, felt like it's, it's just less masonry material. Um, aesthetically, it, it should look good. I, I understand your, your point. It's a good one. I don't know. I can't remember if we established this last time. But is that a private drive? It's not. Good, good question. Um, John, you want to yes, answer that? Yes, it's a private it drive. Is. Okay. And are they going to put the gates on it as depicted in the original drawing? They are, yes. Uh, laying in on it, I, I think that uh, this looks like it'd be in keeping, and, and uh, the staff noted that they're being placed in the existing gate structures that are already permitted. I, uh, I think they, uh, look, uh, they meet all the requisites um, for the variances, which would be two, uh, and uh, at least, um, you know, they, if you had to do some other signage, I think it would even be more cumbersome. So I think it, uh, but it, I do think whatever motion is would be limiting the signage to exactly that on that tower on the lettering as presented today. Is there anyone else to, that oh, to speak? Or? Sorry. Is, somebody is in the audience. Is there anybody here wishing to speak on this matter today? Yeah, and I think if we move to approve the application, it's as depicted in the application. So we need, don't need any qualifying language. Would we? Okay. Uh, I'd move to approve case number 14554 um, because it meets the statutory standards for a variance. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the variances to the minimum height and to the uh, location on the right of way on the depiction of the. Uh, Towers, entry towers, uh, as per the exhibit presented by the applicant. And so all in favor, let's vote. The variances are granted. Thank you for your time. Item number two, case number 14569, request for a variance to the requirement that an accessory building be located behind the rear wall of the main structure in the R1 single family residential district. Okay, at 5917 Northwest 81st Street. Thank you for the record. My name is Eric Groves. I represent Teresa Phillips, who's here with us today. Teresa and the Phillips Family Legacy Trust. Last June, uh, Teresa bought a property located at 5917 Northwest 81st Street. She sold her house and bought this one so that she could care for her parents. Her mother suffers from dementia and her father from Alzheimer's disease. So this house accommodates Teresa and her parents. That's why she bought it. Uh, after she acquired it, she applied for a fence permit. At the time she did so, she presented a site plan showing where the fence would be. The site plan included a little shed. City personnel told her that, and it's a small shed, uh, uh, she wouldn't Sorry to interrupt. At this time, did the shed exist on the property? Pardon me? Uh, did the shed exist at this time on the property? No. Okay. No. When she presented the fence fence permit site plan, she drew in where the shed would be. She was told you don't need a permit for the shed, and there was nothing said about its location. So they went ahead and erected it. Um, it's a portable shed, can be moved. <clears throat> and um, having done that, uh, at some point, somebody complained about it and said it was 
on the side of the yard when it needed to be behind the main building. Um, if you look at your exhibit books, you'll see exhibit uh, F, no, strike that, exhibit I is a series of letters and emails exchanged between me and J.J. Chambliss in which we discussed all of this in an effort to try to resolve it. Hey, I just for the record note that we just received this, to, this, this exhibit book today. Yes, yes. Th thank you. Yes. Some of the information in the exhibit book was part of the application, but not all of it. Um, and I'm, I'm providing the exhibit book for your reference, not asking that you study it, of course. <clears throat> so, uh, JJ and I discussed this pretty thoroughly as to what the best way was to solve the problem and decided that it would be necessary to seek a variance. Now, the variance would be from section 59-12200.2C1F. This little shed complies uh, as an accessory building with all of the ordinances of the city, including the one I just cited, except for subsection F. It is not behind the main building. So um, what we want to do is propose uh, a solution to the board uh, that will uh, minimize the view of the shed from the street may not be able to be seen at all under the plan we want to uh, suggest. Now this is an unusual piece of property. If you look at exhibit A in the exhibit book, you'll see it's shaped like a piece of pie. The top part of the slice of pie is the street. The bottom narrow part of the pie runs down to a creek where all the property all along that street runs off. Um, the second one, uh, uh, exhibit B shows the current placement of the shed and the fence. Now the shed uh, is right now is beside the house and before uh, the Phillips bought this place there was a tree uh, that blocked the view of the shed from the street but the previous owner took that tree down. Uh, of course it can be replaced but I think if you could you can look at it as a, that's what the shed looks like now. Now uh, we can change that in several ways. We're going to propose to move it uh, further to the rear, first of all. Second, closer to the fence that uh, divides the lot next door from my client's lot. The fence is not on the property line, but it does provide a division. We can change the lean-to roof if we need to, if you direct us to, so that it isn't quite as high as it is now. And then we can put back the tree that blocked the shed from view from the street. Can I ask you if you could uh, discuss the, the minimum necessary to alleviate the, the hardship by not why you can't put it behind the yes, building I, because... Yes, I was, I was about to get that. that okay. Get to that. That has to do with the nature of the property and its topography. Um, this board that I have here, uh, I think, is the same as Exhibit C in your book. Uh, here's the street, and here's the house. The house has a pool, and the pool deck, and the ramp that goes down there. And the, the water flows down to the creek. This is sort of the dividing line. This way, the water all flows. It's, it's rather a steep drop-off between uh, here and the creek. It goes down at, at a slope, serious slope. So these green lines depict the only level ground where you can put the shed. And this is where the shed is now. We propose to move it, but it has to be moved to where it's level enough to move it. Now. Um, Further down behind this pool deck, this area near the creek floods during a rain event. There is a shed way down toward the back close to the creek, but it's rotted away because it floods when it rains. So we can't put the shed back here in the flood area, and we can't put it where the pool is. Um, we behind the building. 
there, there really isn't any space to do it. Um, but let, let me show you where we want to put it. And I think. Uh, <clears throat> okay. One of the uh, issues we faced was that the War Acres Bethany uh, Sioux Authority has an easement for a pipe that runs along here. Um, we contacted them and said we have portable shed and that we wanted to move it over closer to the fence. Uh, would they have any objection if we put it on their easement? And uh, the manager of that authority said, no, he didn't. He wrote me a letter to that effect. I have a copy of it, should you wish to see it. Um, and since it can be moved, it's really not a problem. So we proposed to put it here. Here's the property line over here. We proposed to put it here because this is still level ground. After this, it, it's a slope all the way down. <clears throat> now, if we do put it here, a couple things can be true. We can change the roof line uh, to a hip or a gable. Um, and we can change the fence a little bit to block the view. And of course, we can put an evergreen tree uh, similar to the one that was out here before. And the complaint about the view of the shed comes from a neighbor across the street. Well, it's obvious that there's a protest uh, because it's visible across this. There's a written yeah. letter of protest. Yeah. The question is, could you level it with the level of the fence line instead of having it show? We are, um, well. At, at a different type of shed or accessory. Well, it would be that, of course, it's a very small shed, but we can change the roof line, which will, I mean, we have a lean to roof line at this point. That can be changed. Uh, what we're looking for here, of course, is permission to move the shed, but not so far back that it will still be entirely behind the main building. But the, uh, if the concern is from the neighbor over here, the shed is visible from the street. I think we can minimize that. Probably wouldn't see it hardly at all if we do what we're planning to do. As to putting in fill, this area here, we considered that, filling this in so we could move the shed back but we are concerned that that fill will change the flow of the water. And we are very circumspect about uh, running water onto our neighbor's property or anywhere else other than where it already runs. Now, my client is here, and she knows this case better than I do and can answer uh, any questions you might have about it. But we think that uh, the only aspect of the ordinance that we want to vary is we put it here, it will still be by the side of the house. There's no place else for it to go, given the topography and the runoff situation with this property. No place else where it will really fit. Now, the shed, of course, is for the father's purposes. It gives him something to do, uh, which is good for Alzheimer's patients. Um, believe me, we have given consideration to any other place we might locate it. No place else really works. but. I think the concerns of the neighbor will be alleviated if we do the things. And of course, if you issue a variance, you can add conditions to it. And you can say, yes, you may have the variance, but you need to change the roof line. Um, and you need to put a tree out of here. So, and, and, and Teresa can explain a little bit about the fence. And then you can put a tree out here. It won't be able to be seen by the neighbor. Okay. Uh before we have, if there's any other people to discuss, I'll ask board members if they have any questions. I think your presentation was pretty comprehensive, so I don't have any questions for you right now. Anyone else? No, I don't have any questions. Okay. Now, the, the other exhibits in the book are for your reference, should you need them. They demonstrate the flow of water, where the ground is level, where it is not. And there's also a picture of the neighborhood that shows where all the runoff goes. We had two notices of violation. Once we received those, JJ and I got in communication about how this could be worked out. So. Are there any individuals here who want to be heard on this matter uh, regarding this item? There is, as I said, there is a letter uh, of protest uh, regarding the, and I will agree. I, I do think it. I do think that's an unsightly shed. No offense. I just. I think it's um, it's very it, it really de, it, 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 
something like that needs to be in the back behind the building. It shouldn't be visible. I, I wouldn't have any trouble if you had it level with the, uh, uh, with the fence line or something, but I still am not totally persuaded because you have a swimming pool back there that you couldn't locate it somewhere behind the building so no one would see it. Uh, it, it won't fit. But if I might, Madam Chairman, let me introduce my client who can explain the yes. consideration process we went through as far as putting it anyplace else. And uh, I think, by the way, as far as unsightliness is concerned, if we are granted the variance and make the changes we want, it won't be unsightly because we'll change the roof line, uh, move the fence, put in a tree, it won't be visible from the street so uh, it wouldn't present uh, an unsightly image. Uh, Teresa, would you explain to the board please the considerations you gave to moving it anyplace else? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that... I need you to state your full... I know you're the applicant, but for the record, please. Thank my you. name is Teresa Phillips and I reside at 5917 Northwest 81st Street. And so you can address what you went, what you um, First, the swimming pool and the pool deck, those were all existing before I purchased the property, as well as the little shed in the back that's rotting away. At the time of purchase, I had no idea that how the water runoff would be. Um, but like he was showing you, all the water runs from the front of the house and back. I also have all the runoff from the neighbors to my south. There's runs across their yard into mine and then down the fence line to the creek. This area right here, where we were talking, that'd be the only place to get it behind the back of the house. However, it's steep enough that if we build that up, it is going to cause a problem for the neighbors and it's going to interfere with all of the rainwater wash that goes to the creek now. It will stop it because this is the only place it's level. That goes to the street and all of that goes to the back. So if we pull that up again, it may even flood my house, but I know it will run back to this home. And there, the corner of their house is even with that area. So if we build it up, the rainwater that comes and runs along the fence line is going to go into their yard. The picture makes it look huge. It's 10 by 16. It's 160 square feet, which is below the 200 square feet where you have to have a permit, which is where part of the problem began when I asked about putting the shed on the side of the house because it was under 200 square feet. So I was instructed then, don't need a permit. And the issue of it being inside the new fence was never brought up because it was okay. This area where it is now, and the fence line that's there now is not on my property line. I pulled, when I put a new fence on the front, I pulled it in significantly from the actual property line because I didn't want, well, I was just moved in. I didn't want my, a new fence to be in my property, in the neighbor's face because I didn't want to make them mad. So I will pull a new fence all the way out to the property line this way to give us more room and it's still level on this side I can also change this front fence to eight foot instead of six foot. There was a, like he was saying, there was a tree there before I brought the, bought the property that had been cut down previously. I can put one where that one was and it will block the view as well. But the 10 by 16 shed is small, but it's big enough for dad to go out and tinker and sand and do the things he likes to keep him busy. It's it's not big, we can change the roof line. That brings it down almost two feet if we change the roof line from what it is to either a hip or a gable as well. But I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make the neighbors happy, but it's, it's little. It looks huge up there. Okay. Board members? Uh, is, is there any uh, building code or fire code concerning how close it is to the house? I mean, being almost attached, but but detached? Six feet. Six feet. And we that's, they're, they're planning on moving it because uh, I discussed that with okay. Mr. Groves. Uh, it would be six feet away from the house in the new location. It would also be, what is it, five feet on the property line, I think? It would also be five feet from the property line. So it will comply in all respects, except it won't be completely behind the house, the main building. I don't think we can see in the pictures. Do you know if there's any windows on the house next to it? 
you know, the house that is next to where the shed will be placed? Um, I can ask my client, but um, I think the fence, the existing fence would block that view. Are there windows on, the, and keep in mind that the house next door to Teresa, it did not complain. It's a neighbor across the street. Are there windows in the house next door? Are they blocked by the there, fence? There is one fence, or excuse me, one window in it. They've got something covering it. I think it goes. But would it, will the shed be in the area where the window is? Because they might not be complaining now, but if the fence is a foot and you put the shed, you know, it will cover. It will be something else that they will have a view to. Um, I, I don't think so because where we're where we're talking about putting it here. In that, uh huh. All the way back. And so where this is, we'll make, make it into that point of my plant that's going up in the picture. But where it is, I don't think it would block them at all. And okay. with the eight foot fence, if we change the roof line, if they see maybe six inches of it by that time, because it's it's ten foot tall. Okay. So your your uh, proposal is to at least uh, change the roof line. Yes. And and if I may I know that in the, in, in the um, protest, there was the issue of it being unsightly, that the fence was unsightly. The, they were concerned about the electric and the plumbing. There isn't any. It's a 10 by 16 shed. There is no electric. There is no plumbing. It's a temporary portable building, just to clarify that. Right, thanks. Mr. Miller, would you like to address anything for us, please? Yes, board. I'm Mike Miller, Inspection Services Superintendent for Development Center. Um, I've been out to this site myself and have looked at it and talked to Ms. Teresa about it, too, as well, uh, after numerous complaints we've got from residents in the area. There are no issues or concerns with the fence as it's been constructed in that area. The problem with the accessory structure is it was constructed forward of the rear line of the house, which does violate zoning ordinance, obviously, while we're here. The uh, site itself, as I stated, does have some physical characteristics that make it difficult to relocate the shed to another location. But uh, this building was a site-built building, meaning it's built on site, wasn't delivered out and moved off a trailer or anything like that. So my suggestion that I'd offered up when I had visited the site was that the building be deconstructed and reconstructed back behind the pool, as they've noted in the floodplain area. I do agree, as a floodplain manager for the city, that it is a floodplain area. But with the conditions of it being a, a portable accessory structure, you could elevate that structure, not necessarily with the ground, but with blocking or other means to raise it up so that it wouldn't be subject to rot or flooding itself. So you, have the, you have the pool in the back, is that yes, correct? Go so the water the would be flowing anyway back there, and you're suggesting that since it's a portable structure, uh, it could still be placed behind the pool, even though you've noted that the other one had deteriorated, that it could be uh, on some kind of... Uh, yes, ma'am. And system. it wasn't very easily determined what the age of the existing structure that was back there now was. Uh, Teresa had even offered up the suggestion of maybe removing the other structure and possibly moving it back there. And uh, it would be difficult to do so. I, I will say that, because there are some trees. The pool does extend out pretty close to the side yard would make it difficult to get the building as built moved back there to that structure. Um, there are some building code issues that we do have, obviously with the location where it's currently located at adjacent to the house, not meeting the minimum six foot setback, setback clearance as required in the International Building Code, and with the addition of not knowing if there's any egress windows that are needed on that side of the house that, that may be encroached upon as well. The other suggestion was moving it directly around the corner of this uh, that she had offered up, but again, you're still abutting the house and still encroaching that six-foot setback area. Um, an option to that, which I don't know was really a viable option, would, would be to make it a permanent part of the house and actually connect it with a foundation and through passage into the house, but that may be a little bit of a stretch too. So. 
Please keep in mind that when we move it, if you permit us to, it will be six feet away from the house and five feet away from uh, the applicant's property line. Uh, putting it anywhere else is impractical. We can't put it on the pool deck. That's impractical. So this pretty, I mean, we've looked, believe me, we have looked over this property to see if there's anything else where it would actually work, and it won't. So we think we can comply with the code in all respects, uh, except it will still be on the side. So a no building permit is required for it, of course, it's an accessory structure. Could you so, explain the hardship? I, I think it's been stated here that in order to move it back behind the pool, you'd have to deconstruct it. Is that correct? You couldn't just... I, 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 would that be correct, Teresa? We have to take it apart and put it back together? Yes. It's, yeah. It won't... Where, how the property is cut through here, this, it, this area through here slopes down so steep, and there's a old... Um, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, uh, there's a tree that with flowers on it. I can't remember what it's called, but my mom likes it. Anyway, that is in the way. from here back that I'm not sure how we would do that anyway even with even if we did cut the little tree down um, but this area like he was talking about if we took down the other shed and put it there the only problem is is if, if you put it on enough blocks to keep the water out of it we're talking about it's going to be need to be about two feet up so it's going to keep it's going to make it really hard for dad to get in and out for starters and erosion alone because the water runs back there the erosion on the blocks is going to end up being a problem and by the way i didn't mention it but there is erosion back here where the property meets the creek the creek is eroding it's gradually taking away land toward the land of the people who live along the street so it wouldn't be a good idea to put it down there for any number of reasons well i think that's the hardship that would need to be established because it looked like to us there is an alternative and you need to establish that that would be a hardship yeah the, the statute speaks of an unnecessary hardship and we all know the case law and uh, the hardship is generated by the peculiarity of the property and this is a peculiar piece of property it's a pie shaped place with a steep drop off it floods uh, if we could put it someplace else we would but I think we can ameliorate the concerns of anyone else by design. Change the roof line, increase the height of the fence, put back the tree that was there before the Phillips bought the property. I, I think I can assure you, in fact, I'm, I'm certain that if we do that, the complaining, and there's only one complaining neighborhood, neighbor that I know of, and there's only one protest letter. I know the person, she lives across the street, and uh, I, I can't imagine she could have any further complaint if we do what we're asking to do. Well, I think she probably would because I think, I guess it's been stated that we can increase that to eight, the fence to eight feet, but there'd still be about six inches visible. And so then you have the tree that would cover up part That's of That's right. And so the neighbor presumably, I think, would still. I think she'd have to look around the tree. <laughs> sure. And, and, you know, whether she complains and that complaint is enough for us to not grant the variance. The hardship, no, the the hardship arises out of the peculiarity of the property. Um, you know, what we're, Teresa's trying to do the right thing by her family and give her father a place to put her around, which is good for Alzheimer's patients. And if we could put it someplace, uh, we would, but we can't. There's no place else but this location. We kind of expressed my thoughts to the board so far, unless there's, I don't think there's any protestants here, are there? No. Okay. I just have one question more. Yes, uh, ma'am. Is, does that, is that, uh, with given the fact of the flooding issue and behind the pool area, are there other places in front of the pool area that that building could be placed? No, ma'am. The backyard's pretty much taken up by the pool, the pool deck, uh, the slope of the land, and other features of the house itself. So there's really no other place to the east, and this house faces directly to the east, but anywhere from the east of that location that the, that the structure could be located. So it would have to be on the west side of the pool or the back side of the pool, as you've seen in the attached pictures here. So on the west side of the pool it could be located? Well, that is, that is where uh, her attorney here has, 
as uh, noted about the creek being behind that, further back behind that. It would be the current location where the current structure that they have out there now resides. <clears throat> Was that one any attempt to bring it off the ground or is it just sitting wood on it? It, it appeared to me that it's been sitting there for a long time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's rotted out from flood water. Yeah, yeah, gonna have, that might very good make sense. Mm. So is there a way that you can have a shed that is only eight feet in height? I Say know. again? You've, you've mentioned that it's possible to reconstruct the roof. Is it possible to shave off, uh, I guess, another six inches or so? So if you have an eight-foot fence, the fence covers the, the shed. How much further down can we bring that roof line, Teresa? We're 10 feet now, you think? It is at 10 feet 4 inches now from the ground the top so if we made it a hip or a gable it will take off about 18 inches so you know it's, it's going to be eight feet eight and a half feet but if throughout the neighborhood there were others with structures on the sides of the house so I'm not the only one yeah that is an interesting observation that there's sheds all over the neighborhood by the sides of people's houses, but you might not think that relevant. I didn't bring it up, but, it, it but that's could a be, fact. Yeah, it yeah. could not be. I mean, so, so six, you know, about six inches, maybe eight, depending on, you know, how the roof ends up. We put that tree back, you wouldn't even see that. Right, and, and there was, if there, there's a view that I found where there was, a, where the tree was before I purchased the house, and the tree is perfectly lined up between the complainants front of their house and the whole side of my house. You can't see the entire side yard because of that one tree. I don't know when it was cut down, how much before I bought it or not, but you know, I'm willing to well, we have a picture of it. In. Yeah, I'm willing to do that. Okay. If that's what it takes. Um, I mean, I think me. that this particular ordinance, the purpose of the ordinance is to prevent unsightly structures. Um, I think that they've offered to make accommodations to get pretty close as possible to that, given the peculiarities of the property. And so I think um, having an eight-foot fence, putting the tree back, and also a, a time constraint, since wow. this is what I, th I think would be not a permanent use, and we wouldn't want this to carry with the land forever. And so I think a period of years, whatever the board would think is appropriate, assuming that they would kind of agree, I think those things met would, would tend to favor granting variance. Do you like to put that in the form of a motion on the conditions, uh, and would you be acceptable to a temporary variance for a period of time, like two years or so? Oh, a little bit the other conditions? About five. Pardon? Five. I, I was going to throw a range of three to five to the board. Keep, keep in mind the, the purpose of the shed is to help the Alzheimer's patients. You know, they need to be busy. Five years might do it. And you can always come back. Yeah, at that time. we can come back. Board members, is there first any other opposing thoughts or a period of time if you agree with those thoughts? Is there one, is there one more thing I could add? Absolutely. If you don't mind, I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, just one more thing of consideration, and I don't know that it really matters in this case or not, but the complainant neighbors across the street are at an elevation above this property of anywhere from six to eight feet. So adding the eight-foot fence, they will still be able to see over it. And I, I thought of that as well as, I don't know what the house across the street is, but if it's a two-story house or something, if you're elevated, you could still see it. Yeah. And hopefully the tree would cover a, a lot of that, and it's a temporary amount of time. Um, but I think there are, there is some degree of hardship here, and so I'd like to accommodate that if we can. And other board members? Oh, I will agree with you about the hardship and a temporary struct variance uh, since we don't, you know, it's something that they need at the moment, but obviously if it's still going to be visible by the neighbors. And almost I feel like we need to also specify a little bit about the tree because they can plant a little tree, so we need to make sure maybe put some more details in it. Well, you can specify the tree. We were thinking in terms of ever, an evergreen. Uh, we have a picture of the tree that was there before, and of course the leaves fall off during the winter. So in order to block the view, we were thinking in terms of planting an evergreen. Uh, now, 
just how big an evergreen is going to be a function of the cost of the tree. Well, yeah, it, I mean, uh, evergreen is not going to grow very much in five years. Well, we'll put there what the board directs so long as it's not financially prohibitive. Did you want to maybe come back um, next week and decide? Because I don't want to grant something to say you have to have an 8-foot or a 12-foot evergreen if that's going to be cost prohibitive. Well, I, I, perhaps the condition attached to the variance could be that we will plant a tree, and it can either be uh, evergreen or the other kind, uh, that when grown, fully grown, will block the view of the shed. Uh, I, I, I don't know. You know, that I, I didn't take down the tree that was there before. And it worked, by the way. The picture we have shows that it worked. It blocked the, the, that, the view of that side of the house. Of course, the shed wasn't there when the picture was taken, but it blocked the side of the house. I, I don't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll buy the biggest, bestest tree we can, but I, I can't tell you that it's going to instantly be an eight-foot tall tree. So oh, are you agreeable to continue it for? I'd, I'd rather not. Um, let, let, me, let me plead with the board the situation we're in here. Uh, the Phillips family is not a wealthy family. Um, all of the resources go for the care of the uh, dementia with the mother and the Alzheimer's of the father. That's where their resources go. Now, I know that finances cannot be entirely the basis of a hardship, but it can be a factor, and that is a factor. Every time I come here, uh, Ms. Phillips has to pay me to do it. I mean, I will do what is necessary to get this variance, but I don't know that continuing it is going to help that much. Agreeing to the tree is a, I mean, we'll agree to the tree so long as what we're asked to do is feasible. <coughs> You know? Yeah, that's that's my thought. Is if we if we say if we agree with you and, and allow you to, to place a tree there, but it's not the, the size that we would like it to be, then you're still in violation. We haven't really provided any relief, and so that's what I'm trying to prevent. And then well, you come back here. We will buy the biggest tree that we can afford. All I ask the board to do is please be considerate of the limited financial abilities of my client. Um, I, I don't know what. I've never bought a big tree. I don't know what they cost, but I've heard that they can be pricey. Uh, but we're willing to do it uh, so long as it doesn't bust us, you know. I mean, that's, that's why I offered continuance. What would the continuance? I hate to do that because I know it costs money. But well, what would what would would you like me to do during the period of the come back with some? details on, on the tree on the tree and so we know whether it's ten thousand dollar tree or a couple hundred dollar tree and what sizes are available again I'm not a, a tree expert so I will do it if that's what it takes to get the variance I mean if the board could agree you know at, at the tree currently has to be at least six feet and full grown will need to be at least 12 feet or well, something then well, we wouldn't need a continuance but again if it's six we, foot evergreen is ten. my client has signaled me that we are prepared to agree to a six foot tall tree we, okay. we can do that today and then fully grown will be at least 12 feet yeah okay. we're good for a six foot tree well, then I'd move to approve um, case number one four five six nine um, subject to the following condition. One, the roof is changed to um, remove the lean, the current lean roof and um, subject to a period of four years and that a six-foot tree will be placed there within the next 30 days and fully grown, that tree will be at least 12 feet. Can you make that 30 days after the, var the variance is issued? Yes. Okay. Because Laura has to write up the variance, don't you? Second. A second. Have to ask the question now. Did you? Did we decide on decreasing the fence or not? 
I need to I, add that because I didn't specify that. But that's also contingent on an eight-foot fence being installed there instead of a six-foot. We will fence. agree to an eight-foot fence. Yes, we will. Okay. Then I'll second. We have a motion and a second uh, to pass. Uh, everybody vote now. And the variance is granted as condition. Thank you for your patience. I know this took more time than you might expect. Thank you. Item number three, uh, case number 14570, request for a variance to the five-foot landscape buffer with nine points of landscape landscaping installed for every 25 linear feet of abutment or tree spaced a maximum of 25 feet on center in the C3 Community Commercial District located at 3300 North Classen Boulevard. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Calcor Drive. On behalf of the applicant, who is also here with me, uh, this is an application uh, for a variance that will allow a drive-through to be installed at the Lee's Sandwiches establishment right there at the northeast corner of 32nd and Classen. Um, currently, there, the building is built, uh, as I'm sure everyone is aware, and so it is a physical impossibility to be able to meet those landscaping requirements. Uh, of note, my, my client uh, does own the property to the east, so certainly what is envisioned in the code requiring the landscape buffer is to mitigate any impacts. Um, I think that that has somewhat been mitigated by the fact that my client owns the property. Um, another, another factor is what this will allow is a more efficient flow uh, of, of traffic on site. This is a very popular restaurant. If you've driven by midday or in the evenings, it's very busy. And so it's believed that um, you know, listening to their customers, having the ability to have a drive through will relieve some of that pressure uh, that is currently there with the, the perhaps limited parking in the parking lot at the busiest times. So um, I do believe we, we meet the conditions. I do believe. Uh, staff has identified one unfavorable consideration. Um, that is that the, the existing fence is in disrepair. I've talked to my client, um, and they are going to uh, fix and repair and replace the fence uh, by this weekend. So uh, that, that issue will be resolved promptly. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, before I open up for questions, uh, I noticed there was a, a dumpster there. Or there are, are you going to have to move some of your... Uh, Yes. Trash, uh, I mean, I, I didn't see how you were going to actually be able to build that, and it looked like it was almost flush with the fence. I was just trying to have trouble figuring out how you'd be able to do the drive through Cindy, if you go back, you have a site plan in your packet. There we go. Yes. Uh, so you can see there, the, the dumpsters will be moved, but you can see there, um, we have submitted plans. Before we filed the variance, I asked that the, the civil engineer submit plans to staff so that we would ensure we had the right width and we met all the requirements, and, and we have done that. The only requirement that we can't meet is this, this uh, the landscape issue. Uh, all the other civil plans have been submitted, and my belief is that they meet code and will be uh, issue a permit upon uh, the granting of a variance. But you can see the trash enclosure. If I had a... You can see the trash enclosure towards the, the southern end of the, of the site. Cindy, if you go up a little bit, a little left, or a little down right there. But there is adequate room. And it's not dissimilar to several other uses up and down Classen. Um, if you look at the, the Neptune sandwiches to the, to the west of Classen, it also has a drive through. I, I drove it on my way uh, down here after lunch. I saw no landscape buffer there. The subway south of us uh, in a similar condition. I see no landscape buffer, um, all of which also abut single family residential. And your applicant, the applicant owns the property to the east, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So the application says a majority of the property is owned by the applicant. Is it all of the property? They don't own north. They don't own north and east. So there's a little sliver of, of fence of the property owner that would be north and east of our site. Um, notice was obviously sent. We've heard no negative reaction uh, from anybody within the 300-foot ring. How wide is that drive, David, curb to curb? Between 9 and a half and 12 feet. Again, what I wanted to do before we even set down this this path was run it through 
permitting to make sure we didn't have an issue um, on width or you know, some sort of handicap or anything like that. And we're, we have confirmed that we do not. This is the only uh, code-related issue that we have that we, we hope to resolve through this variance. Anybody want to be heard on this matter in the audience? Uh, my primary concern was just additional traffic, and I'm familiar with that area, um, additional traffic through that drive through lane and the possible noise that would accompany that kind of traffic. Um, I think it tips in your favor that they close at 5 o'clock on weekdays, um, so you're not going to have that noise at 11 o'clock at night or something. Uh, and as well as lights and headlights and things like that. Um, that said, since they've offered to replace the fence anyway, could they put an eight-foot fence there instead of the six-foot fence? Okay. Um, I saw some power lines and things, and I don't know if, if there are any restrictions in the code that would prevent a height, but I think just a taller fence, since there's going to be more traffic there, you're already putting a new fence there anyway, I think makes sense. Yeah, we can, we can agree to an eight-foot fence. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have one of the exhibits with me in the area that is the northeast corner of the property, um, the area where the vehicle will do the last curve before leaving. Yes. Um, I don't see any landscaping there. Is there a possibility, obviously I'm not an expert on this type of plans, but is there a possibility to put anything in that little corner since that's what the other house will see, the one that they do not own? Yeah, let me, let me ask our civil and if there is we can certainly agree okay. to do something in that once the turning movements are worked out mm -hmm. okay. is there going to be room looks like they have a computer with dimensions so we believe there's an existing tree that is that doesn't show up on this uh does okay. it have an aerial you could go to no um and so certainly if it can be saved within what we need for, for turning radius, it will. Okay. And if there's not an exi existing tree, can we make sure that there's some type of, sure. if there's lighting from the drive through you know, that little corner, we know it's not the house itself, but it's something the property, the person that lives in the area will be able to yeah. see. It, yeah, so if we have room, we can absolutely, absolutely agree to, to do some form of landscaping if there okay. is room. I'm not sure how to. Uh, I can't hear what they're saying. So if they need to say something, we have to approach. There's a large elm tree in the corner. <clears throat> I, my main concern is you know, if you get an F-250 in there, he might get hung up between the fence and the building. They did all the turning okay. radio. Like I said, we submitted, we, we already submitted our plans to staff okay. uh, for, for permit approval. Um, and when we got back the sheet, you know, the only thing that, that came back was the variance on the landscape. So to address Ms. Herrera's concern, I, I think I could probably support it subject to increasing that fence height and also making sure that there's landscaping in that area that, that she mentioned. If there's an existing tree there, then that criteria is met. And if there's not, then something will be placed there. I went there today. I mean, I saw greenery there. It just didn't look pretty. So I don't recall if there was a tree or not. So the intent is to keep the tree that's existing. Okay. Because there's a, there's a piece outside of what will need to be poured as concrete. Okay. Thank you. I'd move approval of case number 14570 for the reasons that it meets the statutory conditions for a variance subject to the um, placement of an eight-foot fence along that, that boundary wall to the east and keeping or adding landscaping on the northeast side that I think currently exists. Second. Now, in terms of keeping, I do want to be clear, though, that I mean, perhaps an act of God could kill this tree and it may have to come out, but... I I just, what no, I didn't I want is barring an act of God. Yeah, barring, uh, you know, the yeah. trees die, and yeah. I don't want our variance to be revoked because, well, you said you were going to keep the tree. So, anyways, just want to make sure. sure that was on the record. Yeah, so not, not <laughs> removing that. Yeah, um, fair and enough. And also, when, when you say that, you know, if there's enough room, then we'll put it there. That leaves you with way too much leeway because you come back to us, no pun intended on the leeway, but um, that leaves you with a lot of um, options to say, well, there just wasn't enough room or something. Fair so enough. Just putting that in there to say that it will be there. A condition. 
And that was a second, is That's that a second, with the conditions. Okay, we're ready to vote. Uh, the variance was granted. Thank as you. As conditioned. Have a presentation. Are there any additional items from any board members? I, I have a, a kind of unusual request of either Mr. Box or Mr. Groves. If you could stay until after this presentation, since you are so heavily involved, this is about the um, housing. I, have a, I know, yeah, and so there's a couple of questions I have. I saw that, yeah, it was incredible. Uh, <laughs> but if you could, there are a couple of questions. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I'm sure the board members are all aware, the City Council recently passed the Home Sharing Ordinances, and both ordinances are included in your packet. There's first a licensing ordinance, uh, which has mainly four parts. Uh, one, that tenants are able to apply for licenses with property owner permission. Uh, separate licenses are required for each property. Uh, there are specific grounds for revocation, which is two or more convictions relating to the property, which is fairly broad. Um, so it could be any kind of conviction relating to the property within the previous 24 months. Uh, and also in the, the Chapter 13 Licensing Ordinance, uh, the fee for special exceptions, usually that is $1,200, and it was reduced to $300 specifically for home sharing. Uh, the more complicated aspect of the home sharing ordinances is the Chapter 59 zoning ordinance, which is where the Board of Adjustment comes into play. So under the new ordinance, in residential districts citywide, hosts must either comply with the following. It has to be their primary residence, or they have to obtain a special exception. In historic preservation districts, it's a little bit different. So hosts there have to obtain a special exception. It has to be the host's primary residence, and the property must be occupied by the host at the time of rental. So all that said, um, anyone who was operating home sharing prior to council's adoption of the ordinance is grandfathered in. So they don't have to obtain a special exception in order to get a license. So they'll have to provide documentation to uh, zoning staff that whether it's a form of a rental agreement or proof of listing, something that they were actually transacting home sharing prior to January 15th. So the um, next slide, special exceptions, board sees them some but not as often as obviously variance applications. So these are for where things don't quite fit into the zoning district and special accommodations might need to be made. So there are some specific standards for special exception approval that it's in harmony with the comprehensive plan, uh, in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the zoning district, uh, that it's not going to adversely affect the use of neighboring properties, and it's not going to generate traffic that's going to be in conflict with the anticipated traffic in the neighborhood, um, that there are adequate uh, public structures already in place to support the proposed use, it's not going to be a strain. Uh, and then the, the sixth is perhaps the, the most important, is that the board can impose specific conditions on the use uh, to assure safety and prevent a nuisance to surrounding properties. So that is fairly broadly worded, so the board will have a fair amount of discretion um, in each application that comes before it to determine what conditions it might want to place to, to mitigate any potential adverse impact. I have one little question on sure. that. On the design issue, we wouldn't be able to be involved in the design issue um, with HB people or what? Well, so I think you know, if there are going to be any kind of physical changes to the outside of 
the home because it is a home sharing, then if it's in an HP neighborhood, they're still going to have to get a certificate of appropriateness for, from the Historic Preservation Commission before they would be able, any physical changes would be able to make to the property anyway. Um, also, in the HP districts, they'll be going to the HP Commission for a recommendation before coming to the board. So um, they will have taken a look at that, and hopefully if there are any, um, they will also have applied for their Certificate of Appropriateness. Um, and number seven is that the board can ad require additional site-proof screening and landscaping um, to help mitigate any other adverse effects. And does being a resident in the house include a detached garage from that house? Yes. From the resident? Okay, so yeah. if they're living in the main house? Right. Yeah, okay. So if, if there's a garage apartment or something, then right. Which I think most of these would probably be in H HP districts. I mean, they'd have to be. <laughs> Any other questions? That's, yeah, that was it. Just pretty, pretty brief. Well, I, I had, had a couple of questions, um, but I didn't want it to come from the answer to come from the municipal counselor, and so the answer could come from an advocate. Um, I think you could answer the question and not bind the city. Um, first, do you are you aware of any pending litigation around the passing? No. Okay, um, and then second, you you both I'm sure will be here on these cases in the future. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, but it seems like the owner-occupied portion is going to be the most significant issue um, for some of these HP districts. And so uh, my understanding of it is, one, you'll need a special exception, and then two, if you don't want to have an owner-occupied, so say someone owns several properties in HP and uses some for, for home sharing, you need a variance to that special exception. And so for our purposes at the Board of Adjustment, we have the statutory standards that we have to find for a variance. And so that would be, it's peculiar to this piece of property. It's an unnecessary hardship. It's the, it's not going to offend the public good. Um, and then it's the minimum necessary. I'm trying to think of a, of a case that would meet all those elements for one of these home sharing. Um, and so if there's, and, and, and if, we, if we find it for one, then I think it would apply to all of sure. these home sharing cases. And so I'm just trying to kind of see what was contemplated there. I think that was the intent. I, I, think, I think that was a large part of the intent. Um, and, and I don't know. I mean, to your point, I don't know what would, what would create a hardship to having to be in this house when you're renting it out. Um, the, the hardship would presumably be, well, it's an, it's an investment property, which is exactly what the legislative body sought to eradicate in this specific provision. Yeah, I, I would agree, except that why would you defer to the Board of Adjustment then? Why would you even have that provision that they come to us? Why do you just not say you can't do it? Um, well, that's what I'm trying. I think, I, think that, I think that what the City Council... Truth? Sure. And so I think that what the City Council did... It was a legislative decision. Uh, okay. And the legislative body preferred to not hear the complaints that... Per it's not dissimilar to... HP appeals now come to this body. They used to go to city council. City council decided that they didn't want to be legislating these things and hearing the complaints. And this board, with a fine group as assembled here, was best fit to hear those types of appeals. It's as simple as that. It, at least in our discussion, that's what I gathered, that council didn't want to hear them. They wanted the board. Well, there's there's an, another factor or two, and I know you all appreciate this, if I may be candid. There were political aspects to this decision. Um, one of the things that concerned us, uh, the council members who worked on this were Mark Stonecipher and Meg Sawyer. Of course, Hired to Chills is in Meg's ward. What we wanted to try to avoid is what we call preemption, which is what happened to the city when we tried to regulate Uber. A powerful enough force could go to the state legislature and say, take away from the municipality the authority to regulate these at all. We'll take care of it, in which case we would lose the ability to regulate this use. So we wanted to try to make an arrangement that would avoid that. Now, we had some other special interests on our side. The Hotel Motel Association was with us. But 
We didn't want to have happen to us what happened to Uber. So we made a deal with Airbnb, basically. Uh, Councilman Stonecipher worked very hard in, to negotiate that deal, and uh, they signed off on this ordinance. So it was a political decision, a legislative decision, and, um, you know, the statutes assigned to this board its jurisdictional uh, rights, and you won't find in the statute anything that says you hear appeals from the HP Commission. But I, I remember that, and I think David will attest to this. The way that happened was uh, the HP Commission would make a decision, and the applicant didn't like it, would appeal to the city council, where it would be more of a political decision than a decision on the merits. And uh, Amy Brooks, who was the Ward 2 council member at the time, worked hard to take that away from the council and put it in the hands of a quasi-judicial body, which is what you are. And, you know, it worked out. So you'll be assigned tasks from time to time. And uh, the municipal legislature has decided this is one of them. I agree. I hope, and I, I hope that's responsive. No, it is, and I understand the kind of the dynamics of it. I'm just, you know, the fact that they delegated these decisions to us, I think, is meaningful because if they wanted an outright prohibition, they would have just said that. And so there must be a case that meets these conditions, I would think, and so yes. I'm just trying to think of what that would be. I guess what I'm telling you is that if there had been an outright prohibition, one of two things would probably have happened. We'd all be in court or the matter would go to the state legislature. And that did not, was not compatible with the interests of our clients and probably not, not good for the city either. So, you know, it was a compromise. But I, I, I do think that, I think as Mr. Privet said, I think that was the intended result, or ten, intended result as it relates to HP, that the person be there at the time because Certainly, you can file a variance. The city will, will take your money to file the application. But um, you know, who knows? The case hasn't walked in my door yet, so I don't want to say that's impossible because I can be creative. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I understand your point. I, I appreciate you all staying. I know you didn't. Sure. Have yeah. To, so I, I, but you will be on these cases, and so I thought it would be a great oh, opportunity. You may show up on one of these. <laughs> Any other questions? No, just thank you for your having them stay and for these questions. Thank you for your input. That was, uh, I listened to some of it on the on council uh, discussions on the ordinance. Uh, anyway, and thank you, Laura, for the PowerPoint and the presentation. That will help us as we, uh, hopefully we won't, other than just seeing them as a special exception, we won't see any variance requests. Yeah, regarding that. It will be interesting to see how many, you know, because in the ordinance it did provide for grandfathering, you know, and so all the people that are currently operating it is important from the, the council that they're not putting anybody out of business. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to see how many cases, you know, you guys really see. I mean, is your docket flooded or is it just a, you know, once every now and then? So that, that will be interesting to see how it works and what parts of the city, frankly, that, that you'll see them. So, all right. Thank you. Anything else? I believe we're adjourned if we're... Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in today. It was a little icy this morning.